The first thing I want to do is create a bunch of particles, that means points. And for that, I'm going to scatter points on a grid. So let's create a grid first, dive in there. And I want to be this grid one by one units and want it to sit exactly between zero and one and one in the coordinate system. So exactly here. Let's also dial down the rows and columns first and then move its center to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. You notice I not only moved it to the side, but also up a bit. And that's just a preparation for later when we are going to turn this from a 2D system into a 3D system. Let's scatter a bunch of particles in there using the scatter sop and set its total count to maybe 20,000 like this. Next, let's group those points, putting them into a point group and calling them points. And we want to have anything in there like this. Middle mouse on this, and yes, 20,000 points in our point group. Next, let's initialize our particle direction. So the direction in which a particle will move by using a point wrangle again. And in this case, I will set the particle's direction just using a vector. So let's call this one there for direction. And let's just randomize it as an initial guess using the point number. And now let's set that direction as a particle attribute, as a point attribute, and visualize it. Again, setting it to a marker, vector, we want to visualize it there. And we can see those vectors all point kind of upwards and into this quadrant here. So let's take care of that. And that comes from the fact that these vector values range only between 0, 0, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So what we actually want to do is fit those using the fit between 0 and 1 command. And we want to fit them between two vectors, one of which will be minus 1, 0, and minus 1. And the other one will be 1, 0, and 1. And the 0 in there is just to scale down those vectors. So the particle headings only point in this x and z plane, not up or down. Let's just normalize this. So all vectors have the same unit length, and we're good to go. Next, I'd like to initialize and store my rotation matrices. And in this case, we're going to use four rotation matrices, one for a left turn, one for a right turn, and one for the sensor angle that's pointing to the left and one for the sensor angle that's pointing to the right. So again, let's create an attrib wrangle in this case and set this to detail because we do not need those matrices stored on every point. That's just excessive amounts of data we are schlepping around this whole simulation. Instead, we will store those matrices on a detail and access them later using the detail function. So we're only storing four matrices and not four times 20,000 matrices. And you'll notice throughout the setup that I'm trying to optimize as much as I can or as decently as I can, because otherwise the setup can get really, really slow and sluggish. And one of the fun things about building setups is building quick setups, because they will be used more often and can be tweaked better. All right. In order to create those matrices, we need a turn angle and a sensor angle. So how far are the sensors spread apart and in which increments or decrements will our particles be able to turn? Let's create those. So turn angle equals the radiance of a float slider called turn underscore angle. Let's create that. Here we go. Copy this, paste it, and let's do the same thing for the sensor angle. And create that slider as well. Let's just make sure that these sliders range from 0 to 360. Like this. So, I don't know, let's enter a turn angle of 25 degrees and a sensor angle of 50 in this case. Next, let's initialize our matrices. Call this one sensor left. And let's initialize it using the ident function. Let's just copy this. Call another one sensor right. And do the same for the turn left or turn right. Now let's rotate our matrices. We're going to use the rotate function and we want to rotate first our sensor left. We're going to rotate around the sensor angle as it's a left turn, which is counterclockwise. We don't need to change the sign of this angle here. And let's finally give this an axis around which it should turn, in our case, the Y axis. Let's just copy this, paste it three more times. Do the same thing for the sensor right. In this case, we need to change the sign of our angle because it should turn clockwise now. And finally do that for the turn left and turn right as well. Again, changing the sign here. And also we need to switch the sensor angle with the turn angle like this. Finally, let's write those matrices out as a detail. Again, this wrangle here is set up to run over detail only. So we can do three at 
sensor L equals sensor L. Copy this, paste it, do the same thing for sensor right, and do three at term left equals term left, and again, do the same thing for the term right, which, when we middle mouse on this, gives us detail attributes for, to be precise, and they each are a three by three matrix. Good. Let's keep this a bit cleaner here. Call this one init there for initialized direction, and this one init rotation matrices, like this. All right, so far for our particles. However, what we also need to create is a volume. So let's do that using a volume node, which we're just gonna drop down here. Set it to be two dimensional along the X and Z plane here. And the size one by one by one is okay. However, we want to move this to the position where our points are. So center is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Now it matches. Also, what I usually like to do to prevent border conditions with things happening here when the sensors try to send something that's outside of this one by one boundary, I'd like to give this a bit of bleed. So let's set the size to be 1.1. So we've got a bit additional space around here. Let's set the sampling divs, the volume resolution to be maybe 400 for starters and set its name to be, well, density. Also, let's initialize this with some values using a volume wrangle. And in here, let's set our density to a noise value. So let's use a simplex noise happening at our current position. And also let's drop down a volume visualizer to be able to see and dial in this volume a bit better. Set the density field to density. There's not much to see here because this noise is really, really large. So to scale that in here, let's add a few parameters. A vector, which we call F for frequency, should come from a parameter here, like this. And let's multiply our position with that frequency. Set this to be, I don't know, 11 by 11 by 11, like so. So we've got a bit of noise going on in here. So we initialize our points, initialize our volume. Let's just make sure that the volume is not in the points group by just copying over this groups up here, wiring in that, and just adding an exclamation mark in front of this. So we middle mouse on this and we have nothing in our points group. Now let's merge both the points and the group. So we have both in one stream now. So that's how the tree currently looks. Okay, it's time to write our actual simulation, our solver, by, well, dropping down a sub solver in which we're gonna wrangle our way through this together. So it goes in the first slot in here and let's dive into the solver. First thing I'd like to do within a solver is make sure that on the first frame, we're not trying to read in a previous frame because on the first frame, there is no such thing as a previous frame. So let's drop down a switch or a previous frame input and our first input slot here and check if our frame count equals exactly to one. That means if we're on frame one here, we're gonna switch to this input here, just piping through what's coming into the first input slot and not expecting anything from a previous frame. Next, I want to split up my GeoStream again into points and volumes. Gonna use that, gonna do that using a split node, which I'll wire in here, set the group type to points, and I want to split by the points group. So when I highlight this and append a null here and append the null on the first input slot, I can see the points coming in and on the second slot, I can see the volume being spit out here. All right, let's actually write the main algorithm here using a point wrangle, which of course is gonna work on the points. However, we need to read in a volume as well, which we're gonna pipe in the second input slot here and call this one sense and move. The first thing I wanna write is totally unspectacular. So what could happen is that some particle, when it moves, goes past this border, past this border, this or this border. And if that happens, I want to wrap around those particles. So if it goes out here, it should come back in on this side here. Just a bit of basic housekeeping. And that's something I'll be needing quite a bit in this algorithm. So why not turn it into a function? So what I want is a function into which I'll feed a vector, a point position, and which checks if the points X, Y, or Z values are below zero or above one. And if so, just move the point to the other side of this grid. So what we want is a function. Let's call it wrap. And it's gonna work on a vector. And it will accept a vector as an input. Call it W pause for wrap position maybe. Okay, and in here I wanna check if my wrap position, so the position that I feed into this function, and in this case the X component, is smaller than zero, then we're just gonna add one to X. And let's make this zero float as well. And let's just copy this here. And also check if the 
x position is bigger than 1. And if it is so, we just want to subtract 1 from it. Okay, let's copy this whole block here and do the same thing for the y position as well as for the z position. Like so. And finally, we want to return our wrap position like so. So that's our whole function. And if you need to brush up your knowledge on functions, well, we've got a neat Vex 101 course. Okay, let's start writing the main part of the algorithm. The first thing I want to do is read in two values. One determines how far my particle should move each step, and one determines how far the sensors are away from our particle. So let's call one float mdist for move distance. And let's create a slider for this call it move distance, create that slider. Yeah, it's down there. And also let's just copy this, paste it, and call the other one sdist for sensor distance. Call the slider accordingly and create that slider. In my case, let's set the move distance to 0.003 and the sensor distance to 0.03. Next, let's look up the matrices for our sensor turns. So how spread apart the sensors are. Call this one sensor left rotation. And we're going to use a detail function to access that value, just middle mouse on this here. So I called it sensor L, coming into the first input slot, like this, copy this, do the same thing for our right rotation, like so, and create our sensor's positions. And when you think about our graphics here, the center position is in the same direction as our movement direction, just the left and the right sensor values are rotated. So we can take our particle's initial position, particle's direction, and the left and right rotation, along with the sensor distance, to calculate these points here where we're going to sample the grid. Let's do that. Let's call the first one SC, pause, that's the sensor in the center. It's going to be a vector. And again, let's look at the graphics. We're going to use this position, add to it the direction, times our sensor length here. So it's V at P, our current particle's position, plus our direction, which is one unit length, times the s dist, the sensor distance, like this. Next, for the vector sensor left position, I'll do the same thing, just I will rotate our direction by my sensor rotation. So I will rotate this direction first here, and then here. Okay, but again, I will add this to our current particle position, which I'll multiply with our left rotation for the sensor. And again, scale this times the sensor distance. And of course, it's not a slort, but SL rot. All right, let's copy this line, do the same thing for the right sensor. So sensor right position is the same thing, just rotate it to the right. Okay, now we're already in the situation where we could be generating positions that are out of this 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 boundary. So we need to take care of wrapping around those positions here using this wrap function that we wrote previously. So let's do that. Just like that for the center. And let's just copy this, paste it two more times and do the same thing for the left and write positions accordingly, like so. Okay, now that we generated those positions, we can use them to read values from the underlying grid. And for later, I have to decide which is the biggest value in this grid. And of course, I could do that with a few if statements. However, keeping in mind that I want to upgrade this to a 3D version later, what I'll do is I will create an array and put all my values that I read in through those different sensors into this array and use the arcsort function to output the array's index with the highest values in the end. Basically, I'm using a bunch of built-in Houdini functions in order to not have to sort those values by myself and find out which is the biggest value manually. For that, I will need to create an array, which I store the values into. And it's going to be a float array. Let's call it reads and start filling it with the first sensor, which is going to be the center. Let's also create a float called read, which will store the current value that we'll read in through the sensor. And we could feel tempted to just use the volume sample command here, which might be a good idea, actually. It's working pretty well, it's solid, it's easy to use. However, it's slow because it interpolates values between grid cells. So it needs to read multiple grid cells and interpolate those values. And in our case, this is not really important for the setup. We can live with a bit of error in there as long as it's fast. And a faster way of reading a grid value at a certain position is using the volume index, which accesses a given voxel directly. And to get that index, we need to convert a position to that volume index. So let's do that first. Call this one V index for volume index. We're going to use the volume pause to index function. 
And this needs to be pointed when we open up the help page for that function. This needs to be pointed to the incoming volume first. So it's coming through the second slot, slot with the ID one. Then it needs the primitive number or the name of the volume. Let's just go with the primitive number. There's only one primitive coming in through that slot, so it's zero. And finally, the position at which to read this volume, which is, well, the center sensor position. So sensor C, pause. So this generated an index, a vector index for one of the volumes voxels. So let's use this function here, the volume index, to actually read the value at this voxels position. So read, which we specified up here, equals to the value at the volume index of this volume coming into the slot with the ID one. Again, primitive number zero at this index we just calculated. So those two lines are basically a quicker but dirtier volume sample function. Let's close this and append this value to our reads array here. We want to push onto reads our read value that we just read in like this. Let's do the same thing by copying all this, pasting it down here for the left sensor. And I don't need to initialize this again, so let's just do it like that. And this works on the left position, like so. Finally, copy this one last time. Do the same thing for the right sensor by just using the sensor right position here. So by now we should have an array with three entries. How do we find out which one is the biggest? Well, we're gonna create another array, integer array this time, call it sorted. And we're gonna use oxsort to generate the contents of this array. So I want to arc sort reads, and this will generate an array with the indices sorted so that the values in the reads array are sorted in ascending order. So for example, let's say the, the center sensor, which is the first entry in this array, is the biggest one, the left sensor is somewhere in the middle, and the right sensor is the smallest entry. What arcsort will spit out is two, one, zero. So just a list of indices in which order the values in reads will increase from smallest to biggest. I'm only interested in the biggest, so in the last entry, so the maximum ID is the last entry in my sorted array, which I'm gonna access through the pop command. And this, of course, needs brackets. This might be a bit excessive, but it comes in handy later when we extend this to three dimensions. So now all we have to do is to check if our max ID equals to zero, that is the center sensor is the one with the biggest value, in which case we're gonna do nothing, or else if our max ID equals to one, which is our left sensor, in which case we're gonna rotate our direction times. Well, we haven't actually read in our rotation matrix. Let's do that and then multiply our direction vector with the rotation matrix. So up here where I'm reading the sensor rotation matrices, let's copy this and read in our general rotation matrices as well. I think I called them turn left and turn right. And now down here, so if our max ID equals to one, so if it's left sensor, we can multiply it with the turn left matrix like so. And finally, let's check if our max ID equals to two, which means the right sensor is the one with the biggest value, and then we're gonna turn the direction to the right like so. Let's finally move this point by adding to its current position the new direction vector times our move distance, which I call, let me scroll up, mdist like this. And let's not store this directly on the point position, but let's use a vector, which we'll call new pause, which is gonna be equal to our current pause plus the direction times the distance, because I have to check for the wrap around again. So again, let's call this new pause and not new po. I'm taking care of wrapping around those values if they exceed 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1. And finally, I'm setting my particles position value to our new position, like this. Well, that's been a lot. All right, let's go through this code one more time and maybe add a few comments. So we wrote a function here to wrap around positions. Then we have our main reading in our move distance, our sensor distance, our rotation matrices, generating our sensor's center, left and right position, making sure they wrap around, then creating array called reads and a float called read. These two lines read in the underlying grids value, and this line here appends it to the reads array here. We do this for the center, left and right sensor, and then use the arc sort 
to sort our red in values and then we turn into the direction of the highest value that we sensed. And finally, we update our particle position like this. All right, so far for the points. Again, these are our algorithm steps. So we sense the grid values, turn the particles accordingly, and move the particles in a new direction. Now what we have to take care of are our operations on the grid. We need to deposit values, blur them, and attenuate them. So let's do that. First thing we need to do is deposit values. And while I'm a huge fan of writing stuff in VEX, in this case, I'm more optimizing for speed. So rather than writing a VEX function to do that, I'm going to use the built-in volume rasterize particles node here, which takes in a volume in the first slot and a bunch of points in the second slot here. And the destination should be our density volume. And this is a really, really fast node to will basically rasterize points into a volume. Just the way it's set up currently will yield this really wide volume. So let's take care of that. The particle scale should be one divided by our grid resolution. And to get that, let's get up one level here. And in the volume node here, let's right click on the uniform sample divs, go to copy parameter and back into our solver into the volume rasterize and right click here to paste this as a relative reference. So that's my particle scale here. Also as for filter, I can work with a point filter here. This does not need to be filtered. Again, this is faster, and that should be it for now. And you can see those dots appearing here. So our particles get rasterized into this volume. So the deposition of values is taken care of for now. Next, we need to diffuse, that means blur, and attenuate, that means decay our values. And again, the straightforward approach would be to drop down a volume blur and maybe a volume mix to do that. However, through a bit of benchmarking, it turns out that those nodes are not the fastest at doing both steps. And if we are okay with not having as many options when it comes to blurring, there's one node that can do both in one operation, which is faster, the volume convolve. What this node does is it takes for a center voxel, it adds up all those values it finds around this voxel, plus on itself, and before adding them up, it multiplies the values by the factors we put into those individual fields. So if we want to have an average blur for a 3 by 3 by 3 kernel, which is this, each value in here should be 1 divided by 27. Why is that? So a 3 by 3 by 3 kernel has 3 times 3, that's 9, times 3, 27 values. And if I'm just adding up those values, well, I'm getting big values, and they increase each step. However, if I multiply them by 1 divided by 27, the whole value of this thing will not be amplified or attenuated. It will just take care that all of these factors will sum up to 1. Let's crack out our calculator and divide 1 by 27, which is 0 0.037, and it goes on forever. So let's actually add a 1 here, just for good measure. And later, we also want to be able to dial in attenuation. So if we multiply this weird value here that we just calculated by another float value coming in through a slider, we are getting this attenuation. So let's just create a float slider on our solver here by going to the parameter interface, adding a float, call this one maybe decay factor or attenuation, whatever you want to call it, hit apply and accept, right click on this and copy that parameter, get back into our solver, and in here paste our relative reference, and we want to multiply this by 0 0.037 and 1, like this. Let's copy this whole block and paste it 26 more times. So we end up with something like this. And again, if you don't like this, you might also be able and actually be perfectly fine with the volume blur. It's just slower. Let's hit up one level and actually dial in this decay factor to something more sensible. One in our case. So now we can see a slight blurring happening between this and this, as well as some attenuation. Okay, the last thing we actually need to do is merge both streams together. So points and volumes come together again using a merge sub, wiring in the points first and then the volume like this. And finally, let's be clean and append a null here, which we're gonna call out to output the whole beauty of this. All right, we set up lots of parameters, not only this decay factor here, but also it might be neat to be able to dial in a coverage scale. That means how much value is deposited each step and also to dial in the move distance or the sensor distance on one place. So let's head up one level. And on the solver here, which I'm gonna color red, that's where the magic happens. On the solver here, let's open up the parameter interface and build a neat interface for the whole thing. Let's dive into the solver again while this is open. And I wanna drag over the move distance, the sensor distance, as well as the coverage scale here. Hit apply, it automatically links up those parameters and maybe let's go up one level again. And also maybe when we're initializing the rotation matrices, let's create sliders for the turn and sensor angles.
And let's set their range to range between zero and 360. All right, that seems to have worked. Let's just link up the turn and the sensor angle with what's happening up here. So it's gonna right click and copy the parameter of the turn angle, go into my innate rotation matrices here and right click and paste relative reference. This has been set to 25, I think. Let's do the same thing for the sensor angle. Again, copy parameter, go up here, paste as relative reference and down here, set it to 50. Let's maybe reorder this a bit. So turn and sensor angle go up. They are quite important. The move distance and sensor distance as well and the decay factor and the coverage scale. Let's call this one deposit value. And this goes before the decay like this. All right, let's save this. Highlight the solver. Let's attach a blast here to get rid of the points. So we're only left with the volume here and maybe Attach a volume visualization, which we again set to density. So we increase the density scale a bit so we can see what's going on here. Let's disable the grid, set our background to be dark. Save this, keep our fingers crossed, toggle real time and hit play. And you can see that did not work as badly, huh? So let's try out a few different values. For example, try increasing our grid resolution here to say 800. Let's dial in our sensor spread to 20 and the turn angle to 40. And let's put the decay factor to say 2.5 and dial back the volume density scale here a bit and hit play again. Yeah, now we're seeing more of that magic happen. And as you can see, this setup is actually decently fast. So that's real time. I'm not speeding up any recording here. However, let's stop this, save this and maybe increment it. And you can see I call it 3D now. 